Well, good morning. Welcome this morning to Bell Road Church. My name is Amy. I'm one of the pastors on staff here. Um, and maybe you haven't seen me around much. That's because I'm hanging out with the kids. I'm kind of the interim uh, pa- youth children's pastor, not youth. Our youth pastor sitting in the front. You can say hi, Vanessa. This is Vanessa. If you want to connect with our youth pastor, she is right there. We have youth at 6:30 on Wednesdays. Um, but I've been working with the kids, and so you know what? I'm going to need a little grace this morning because I might be a little bit more animated or sore of crazy or say a few things, you know, like, Shh, put your hands over your mouth, <laughs> right? One, two, three, eyes on me, right? <laughs> so, so pay attention. That will help me not say crazy things. Uh, but I am so glad that you guys are here this morning. And, and really the message that I have to bring is, is on my heart, in my heart, and convicting my heart. Um, but this morning, God really laid some things on my heart for you, that you are uniquely created, that you are are fearfully and wonderfully made, that God has a purpose for your life that only you can fulfill in this world, right? That's you individually. God has an anointing, a calling, and giftings, and he needs you to use those in this world. And what stands against us, what stands against you, what stands against me, it's this little temptation the devil throws at our face. It's a preoccupation with what people think of us really that causes us to put on this mask called the false self. We all struggle with it. And living according to the false self, what happens is that we lose out. And our children lose out, and our families lose out, and the church loses out, and the world loses out on your light that's shining in you that God wants to use to push back the darkness in this world. Amen? So we're in this series called Identity. Everybody say Identity. Identity. And so if you're listening on podcast, welcome. I hope you enjoy it. This is the third in our series. So um, we have one more to go. And we are going to be talking about um, the third temptation. We're talking about how Jesus was in the desert and the devil tempted him three times. And this third temptation is the temptation to find who I am and what other people think. Basically, I am what other people think. And really, our society is addicted, right? We're addicted to what other people think. You see that on Facebook, social media, all these places. I mean, how many times does it take to take a selfie before you can post it, right? Let me see that. Can I put a filter on it? Can I get a different angle, right? We're, we're trying to put our best foot forward. And the worst part about it is that sometimes this becomes our identity, this false persona that we're putting on social media. And it's, it's really the fear of man, isn't it? That's what I like to call it, the fear of man. And, and you know, for me personally, I was thinking back at this, and I even struggle sometimes with feelings and emotions that I had back in high school of wanting to be popular or the favorite or the prettiest or the best. And if I think if you were honest, you might say that you have some of those feelings too, which is funny because you think that, man, I'm 35 years old. I shouldn't be thinking and feeling like a 15-year-old. But you know what happens? We go back to our uh, high school reunion and we think that we're bigger than that, but yet we aren't, right? And we know this because of the fake eyelashes. We know this because of the, all, the, all the weight loss before, the puffed up inflated job titles and the picture perfect children, right? That we show everybody at our 10 year reunion. In fact, at my reunion, I went to my 10 year reunion and yes, I did have some of those flusters. Um, but some of my friends didn't show up because they don't, they're only going to the 20-year reunion because they want to make sure that they're physically fit and look hot, right? And so we still struggle sometimes with this, and that's because we, we put out there this manufactured version of ourselves, don't we? And it, it's the one that we want the world to see. Now, I have a little illustration for this that's kind of fun. I put a little surprises in your chairs this morning, and so it's either on the right or the left side taped to one of the legs, but I have a real ring for some of you in this place this morning. Some of you get gypped, but let me know if you find it. Hold it up. Ah, you can even scooch over to the other chairs because there might be chairs nobody's sitting in and steal it. Now, boys, I know you really want these rings, but 
feel free to give them to the lady of your choice. Ah, Jardin, he got, he got one. Yeah. Come on. And what I have for you is a real, oh, thank you, my little illustration. It's a real cubic zirconian. You're welcome. I hope you enjoy it. But you know, like this ring that you're holding in your hand, and it's your gift. You get to keep it. Um, we tend to be man-made, don't we? And being man-made, do you know that cubic zirconian you're holding in your hand is flawless because it's man-made? There are no flaws in it. It's carefully crafted to please. And aren't we sometimes carefully crafted to please? Please our bosses, please our spouse, please our parents, please our family, uh, our significant other, people we don't even know on Facebook, right? And isn't it exhausting? I don't know about you, but I'm exhausted trying to please people. And why, why do we do this? Why do we live the false self? Why do we fall into this trap? What I am, what others think of me. And you know, even Jesus was tempted by this, which is so kind of encouraging and also striking to me that, that Satan came to Jesus and he basically said, so you're the son of God. Uh, why don't you prove it? Why don't you, and we're going to read and you can start turning there to Matthew 4, 5 through 7. But he basically says, why don't you show people just how awesome you are with a public display of the angels saving you? And I don't know about you, but there's a few times when I'm in public, I kind of want to show off too and just show people just how incredible I can be. How, now, get in your mind. I put this on Facebook. I asked this question. What's something that you did in high school that you thought was going to make you look so cool and it was just an epic fail? Did anybody, if you saw that on my Facebook, you can go back and read the stories. They're really funny. And I was thinking through one of mine and I, I actually thought of Tyrone's more than mine. But when I was in high school... <laughs> I know, and I'll tell it in just a minute. <laughs> when I was in high school, I was a basketball player, and we had all these seniors, uh, senior boys, watching our game, and I just thought I would be so cool, and so I got a breakaway, and I thought, I'm not just gonna do a little breakaway, I'm gonna run so fast, I, the, those girls eat my dust. Well, I did. I ran so fast uh, that I didn't make the layup, and I ran into the wall. And I literally went, boom! Boom. It was real awesome. But my favorite uh, was Tyrone's. And he thought he was so cool while he was water skiing. And his whole youth ministry was at the shore watching him water ski. Are you going to kill me for sharing this? I was watching. This is my favorite story of his. He's water skiing and everybody's looking at him and he's feeling so good. You know, at this point, he's thinking, I am such a good water skier. Everybody's watching me. Well, he falls on his butt and gives himself an unintentional enema. <laughs> we can pause and laugh right there. If you don't know what an enema is, ask me after the service. I'll happily tell you, or Rose, who's a nurse in here, she can share with that, that with you. And so he thought, I've got to get as soon as possible to the shore. And in his mind, I'm going to do this so smoothly. I'm just going to ask him to pull up and just right up onto the shore. Well, he totally biffs it on his face, right in front of everybody, just hits the sand and biffs it. Um, and I, I just share that story because I know that as I share it, you have those feelings welling up inside of you. That moment when you knew you were trying to draw people's attention and do something show off and do something so cool, but you totally biff it, or it's an epic fail. And you know what really ends up happening when we're trying to show off is we either humiliate ourselves or we humiliate somebody else, right? And so Jesus, here's Jesus, and you can go ahead and turn right now to Matthew 4, um, 5 through 7. And, and the Satan takes him and is talking to him in the desert and basically saying, you know, if you go up on the temple and jump off, everybody's going to see it. He was asking him to go to a public place. So we'll read that right now. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple, where basically everybody could see him. If you really are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And basically what he's saying is, why don't you show off right now? Not very many people believe in you, but they could 
if they watch the angels come to your rescue, some big, amazing show happens. They could believe in you. And Jesus answers him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to test. And this is a temptation. We forget sometimes that Jesus is, he is fully God, yes, but he is also fully man. And he has those feelings. And ultimately at this point, people didn't think anything of Jesus. He was in effect invisible. And they really didn't even value him. In fact, I'm sure that he had feelings of unworth and uselessness and, and felt very devalued even at this point. And sometimes when we do that, we begin to put a higher premium on what other people think. And we all do it a little bit unintentionally, where we begin to believe that if people love us, then we're really somebody. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as I go on, but it's really when we begin to put on the false self. Like when we begin to prove ourselves and do things for attention, what we're really doing is putting on the false self. But the false self becomes so a part of us, sometimes we don't even know the difference. And there are consequences to that, big consequences, like fear, self-protection, possessiveness, I was worried I would say that wrong, manipulation, self-destructive tendencies, self-promotion, self-indulgence, the list goes on and on and on, the price we pay to, for our false self just is not worth it. And it comes down to this. We want to meet other people's expectations. I know I do. I don't want to disappoint. And I feel like Jesus in this moment was trying to meet, or even the devil was trying to tempt him to meet people's expectations. And he had to choose if he was going to live by the false self or the true self. And you know what? Jesus was a disappointment to many people, which is amazing to hear. Jesus, by being true to himself and obeying the Father, he disappointed his family. He disappointed the people he grew up with in Nazareth. He disappointed the religious leaders of the day. In fact, they said, all the things you're doing is, is because of demons. And he disappointed, ultimately, his closest friends, the disciples, when he didn't rise to power as a political leader. Jesus walked in disappointment. It's a powerful thing to think. And it had to be an enormous pressure that he had to withstand. We think of all he withstood physically, but emotionally, the amount of disappointment that people had because they did not understand what God was doing on this earth. He had to find his true self, his true identity in what the Father said about him, not what others. So my question for you today is this. Are you afraid to disappoint someone? And who? Who are you afraid to disappoint? That tells us a lot about our false self. Who are you afraid to disappoint? And we see in all three of these temptations, and you can go back and look there in, in Matthew 4, we see in all three of these temptations, the devil says, if you really are the Son of God, if you really are the Son of God, prove it. Show everyone right now. And I don't know about you, but I've been in that place wanting to prove it. In fact, one year I was doing an internship and I had um, one of the other interns, whatever my assignment was, she would do it and try to do it better and be like, well, she failed. And I mean, I wanted to prove it. You bet. I wanted to punch her lights out. I'm not going to lie. Have you ever had that experience where you have someone in your life and they're looking down on you and they're saying, you're not good enough. And what do we want to do? We want to prove it. We want to humiliate them. I mean, I thought so many ways in my mind, like what I could do to really make her look like a fool, right? So I want to prove it. And that's what the enemy does to, to us, right? He looks at us and he says, oh, you think you're a child of God? Prove it. And so what happens is we think then, if I'm a child of God, if I'm a son or a daughter, or if I'm a Christian, then I can't ever tell people about what I did last week. If I'm a Christian, I can't share about the doubts that are running through my mind. If I'm a Christian, I can't really tell people my deepest struggle because really they're not going to believe. It's these ifs that we hear the enemy saying, prove it, prove it. And so what do we do as Christians? We do what the world says we do. We become hypocrites. 
and we put on this beautiful outside. And Jesus even says, um, you whitewash tombs. You're beautiful on the outside, but you're dead on the inside. But the motivation of that is because we want to prove that we're, quote unquote, good Christians. And so the enemy begins to attack our very belief in, in who we are. In Matthew 3.17, right before Jesus is tempted, what happens is amazing because Jesus hasn't even come into his full ministry yet. He basically gets baptized by John and then goes straight in the desert to be tempted and then begins his ministry. So this is before his ministry even begins. The enemy is trying to snuff him out because he knows if he can get to the heart of his identity that he can stop what he's going to do. And the same goes for you and me. God has a plan for you and he has an identity for you. And the enemy knows that he can snuff it out if he gets right to the point of what you believe about yourself. And so in Matthew 3.17, right before he goes into this temptation, Jesus is being baptized by John in the river. And a crowd of people are there. He gets baptized. He comes out of the water. And the heavens open up. And, and the Father God says to him, This is my son whom I love with whom I am well pleased. That's an incredible statement. And don't you think it's incredible that right after that, the enemy would come right at the very heart of that statement. If you are the son of God, then prove it. He comes right at that statement. And the truth is that all of us, we are loved because of who we are not because of what we do. And like I said, the devil tries to attack the very core of who you are because he's trying to snuff you out from what God has for you. For us as believers, our identity is in Christ, right? And he's made it possible that you can be and that I can be a son and a daughter of God. And I'll say this to you this morning, your identity, it's waiting for you. Your purpose, it's waiting for you. God has it. He wants to give it to you. And oftentimes we look at this scripture that I even mentioned of his temptation and we think, oh, it's because he knew so much scripture that he could quote it back at the devil. And because he quoted scripture back at the devil, that, that's the power. And so I got to memorize more scripture. And then the more I know, the better Christian I'll be, right? But it's, that's, it's so much deeper than that. What happened is he believed the words of his father because he was the son, because he knew he was the son. And the same goes for us. You can memorize so much scripture, have it up here, right? But that doesn't mean you have it here. Until you believe who you are, you believe who God has created you to be, you can't trust his. I am what people think of me because we don't know or because we've forgotten who we are. There are some of us in this room, we've never met Jesus before. We have no idea what our are. But there are also some of us in this room, it's been revealed to us. We've met a living God, and he's given us our purpose and our identity, and we've forgotten who we are, and we need to be reminded of who we are and what he has for us. Maybe you need to hear those words this morning. You are a child of God. You are a son. You are a daughter that you are loved and that he is pleased with you. I believe that we all need to hear those words. So what can we do? Let's talk about this a little bit more practically. What can we do to walk in this? How do we receive who we are in Christ? How do we walk as sons and daughters of the living God? And I think there are three things that we can practically look at Jesus' life and see how he was able to believe who he was. And those three things help us live according to the true self. It's really authenticity is what I'm talking about this morning. And so if you're taking notes, number one is time alone with God. And you see Jesus, man, he takes off all the time on those disciples. Oh, that woman needs food. Okay, I'm going to go over here and take a nap and be with God, right? He takes breaks all the time to be alone with God. And, and yes, that is reading your Bible um, and praying, talking to God. It's a way to know more about Jesus. And in turn, as you learn more about Jesus, he reveals more about you. But more specifically, I'm talking about what Jesus did, which was silence and meditation and solitude, just being in God's presence. So often we're doing for God. 
we're doing this for God. We're doing worship for God. We're serving in the children's ministry for God. We're, we're doing, doing, doing. And God just wants you to be. And that's what Jesus did so well. Because it's in, in those silent times where the noise is cleared out that we can actually hear the voice of God, right? My teeth are dry. I keep licking them. Forgive me. But it, the Holy Spirit is the great revealer. And when there's too much noise, we can't hear. Because God doesn't just want to reveal who he is to you. He wants to reveal who you are. And not just like vague, you are a child of God. He wants to reveal to you that you, your specific giftings, your calling, and your purpose. He has a purpose for your life. So number one, time with God. Number two, friendship or fellowship. We need each other. Who would have thought? I need you. You need me. We need each other. We need friendship. We need to dive into a community of believers um, that help us grow. We're created, created for that. John even was with Jesus when he was baptized in, whole, uh, baptized in water, right? And there was a crowd. And Jesus, um, it was revealed by God that he was the son of God in this great big crowd. But God also wants to reveal things to us as he brings us together. He convicts us of things, and how we treat each other reveals a lot about who we really are, doesn't it? God's greatest tool to reveal our character is actually relationships with others. And part of that is that we really can live the false self, right, when we're by ourselves. But when we're with someone else, we can't live the false self. When we just have surfacey relationships that are just on Facebook or, you know, hang out here and there and it's not deep relationship, that's really when we can, like, flourish in the false self because our sin then flourishes in, in darkness. But relationship gives us an opportunity to give and receive forgiveness through confession, Right? James 1.16 says, confess your sins one to another, and he is faithful to, to heal you and to forgive you of your sins. So basically, James is saying that confession to another person brings healing. And so confession is a huge part of, of our authenticity and living out our real self. We need people in our lives that love us enough to speak the truth, right? And stand by us in our failures, in our dark times. But I think... It's not the kind of friendship that says what you're doing is okay. It's the kind of friendship that says, I love you enough to weep in the pit with you, but I also love you enough to pull you out of the pit. That's the kind of relationship I'm talking about. And here at Bell Road Church, I've seen it in action. It's been a huge blessing. And I just want to thank you for being a community that I could be authentic in, that you could love me, but you could also say, hey, let's not do that again. Because I love you enough to say that. And this is a community, I'm going to encourage you, this is a safe community where you're going to be accepted and you're going to be loved and you're going to be fought for, and we, but we also want to pull you out of the pit because we know that God has an abundant life for you. That's the kind of community this is. So number one, time with God. Number two, friendship, fellowship. Number three, move out of your comfort zone. Just what you wanted to hear this morning, right? Everybody likes to be uncomfortable. Raise your hand if you like to be uncomfortable said no one. Yes. I want to be, I want to be uncomfortable too, but authenticity is really, and being true to yourself requires vulnerability and vulnerability is not comfortable, especially for some of us. It can be downright frightening and terrifying and it requires courage. I read a quote the other day that says sometimes when you're vulnerable that you feel naked and exposed, exposed to praise and rebuke, right? Exposed to kisses and hugs. And that's why sometimes we stay away from vulnerability because we realize that we're offering an opportunity not just to be loved but to be rejected. And it takes courage. And I'm not talking necessarily about being real, okay? In the name of being real, we've been real hurtful, we've been real mean, and we've been basically real carnal. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what Jesus did. Jesus put himself out there. Jesus wept in the Bible. Do you know that Jesus, he wept with people? He got righteously anger. That's the one I like to hold on to. Do any of you like to get righteously angry sometimes? Yeah. He took naps. Jesus left people and took naps, <laughs> right? That's kind of funny. And he even rebukes people publicly. 
Jesus wore his emotions out for people to see. He showed them. And I think that represents God in a really amazing way because Jesus is the representation of God on this earth. That God allows your emotions to be shown. And sometimes in order to be real and live the authentic self, or auth we have to, we have to get uncomfortable. Now grab your little rings. If you got a ring, grab your little ring. Um, like I said earlier, I gave you a real cubic zirconian diamond. There you go. It's real. You can really say it's real. But you know what's funny about that is that it's flawless. I mean, it's flawless, isn't it? Because it's man-made. It's flawless. There are no flaws in that little plastic diamond you have. But it's worthless. Absolutely worthless. The difference between a cubic zirconian and a diamond is that a diamond is priceless. But it's also flawed. And it's its flaws that authenticate it. Isn't that just the opposite of what we believe right? We oftentimes buy into this temptation because we don't believe that God can love us or that we can be children of God because of our flaws. And Hebrews 2, 14 through 18 has a different take on that. And I want to read that to you really quick. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared their humanity so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death. That is the devil, the tempter and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For surely it's not the angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. And just a little side note, Abraham's descendants are the children of God because they live by faith. So you are Abraham's descendants when you live by faith. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people because he himself suffered when he was tempted he is able to help those who are being tempted he bought your flaws with his blood and you know those flaws that you have given to Jesus can become something powerful to help transform someone else's life that gifting, that ability, those things, those plans that God has are not destroyed because of your flaws. But if you give those flaws to Jesus, they can be turned around and used because he is the great redeemer. He exchanges our crap for something priceless. And we can be sons and daughters of God because of what Jesus did on the cross, which means we have an inheritance and that we have an identity in him and we can be who we're created to be because of him. If you would stand with me, we're gonna pray. I hope you got something out of this message. I know writing it was good. I, not just the cubic zirconian fake diamonds that I gave you. I was so tempted to buy a really expensive one that somebody would look at and be like, holy crud, they really did give me a diamond. But that would be kind of mean, wouldn't it? It's a little bit mean. Um, we're going to pray real quick. I want to invite the worship uh, leaders to come on up. If you bow your heads and close your eyes, we're simply just going to talk to Jesus. Jesus, thank you so much for what you've done on the cross for us. Thank you that you're a God that redeems, that you take our flaws and you can use them for something beautiful. Today, we ask that you would do something real in our hearts and our lives. God, that you would transform us. In Jesus' name, amen. As we close this morning, I want to remind you there are things in this world that need to be conquered. You know them. You see social injustice. You see it at your work, right? There are things in this world that need to be conquered and that will be conquered when you find your identity in Jesus Christ. So as we pray, I just want to speak to those of you in here that you have had your identity in Christ before. He's spoken that over you, and you've forgotten that. If that's you, would you just lift your hand up? We're going to pray and just say, Jesus, remind me of my identity in you. I need to be reminded of who I am, that I'm a son, that I'm a daughter. I need to be reminded of my purpose. I've lost sight of that. I've let the noise of the world crowd it out. I've let the desire to please and prove that I'm a good Christian crowd out who you have really, truly called me to be. 
And if you're in here this morning and you have never given your flaws to Jesus, you've never given your life to him and said, hey, this is, this is my crap. Would you redeem it? With every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you this morning, if you just lift your hands to God and say, today, I give you my flaws. Today, I ask you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. I want you to redeem my crap. If that's you in this place, just lift your hands to Jesus. And we're and, and I'm going to pray a prayer. And you're just going to agree with me. Dear Jesus, today, I want to give you my life. All of it not just the good shiny parts. I want to give you the the worst parts and I want to ask that because of what you've done on the cross that you would heal, that you would redeem, and that you would restore. Today I ask you to be the Lord of my life and my Savior. Set me free. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Just thinking about how, how sad it is though as we grow up, we learn to put on masks and put our false self out to everyone so they don't know our issues, our flaws, our hurts, our struggles. And uh, it's scary that we can live that out for months and even years. And it's a great reminder for us to take off the mask, to don't live that false self, that false identity, and to uh, be authentic, be real, which means sometimes it's confessing Uh, Man, I got some issues. I got some sin. I got to let go of some stuff. But thankfully, there's a God who cares, who forgives. And we have community who cares, who love regardless of imperfections. We need that, right? We need both of those things, God and community. And, I, you know, like Amy said, it's good for us to, to, to be appropriate. You know, we don't always want to uh, just in the name of being real just you know walk around with our you know head down and life's miserable and and no one loves me and, and act like Eeyore but so it's okay to be appropriate sometimes but we need those moments like these we're like I just need to take the mask off and take this false self off God help me to live who you've called me to be help me to be my true self you are his son you are his daughter don't ever forget that that's the most important truth about who you are You are His. You belong to Him. That, my friends, changes everything. Everything. You are His. I pray that you would not forget that as you leave this place here today. I belong to Him. I'm His. Jesus lived out of that identity and it helped Him be who He was, who He was supposed to be. Same is true for us. Live out of that identity. 